Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash for This Week in Prophecy, November 12th, 2018. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends, and welcome to This Week in Prophecy. We'll begin in the Middle East, although the focus of most events, while related to the Middle East, did not take place in the Middle East as actual week. They took place in Europe and, of course, in the United States but all of them of some prophetic import. In Israel, reduced attacks have taken place in some kind of an alleged record, uh, accord between Israel and Hamas, with financial support going to Gaza, circumventing the Palestinian Authority. We are unable to officially document the veracity of these reports, hence we will hold off until next week in addressing them. However, a barrage of missiles was fired from Gaza, approximately five. Two of them were down by the Iron Dome this week. But this week in prophecy, seven Hamas terrorists from the military arm of Hamas, including their commander, Nori Baraka, were killed by Israeli commandos in a commando raid. It had become next to impossible to pinpoint their location to take them out either by artillery shelling or by airstrikes, hence it was necessary to send Israeli commandos into Gaza. This was almost certainly carried out by Sayeret Makal or some other secret unit of the Israeli military, entering in civilian clothes, probably, but also driving civilian vehicles. They were sighted inside of Gaza and ambushed. The Israeli commander and another military officer were killed. Their identities cannot be disclosed for security reasons. Sayedat Makal and other such units operate under the veil of secrecy. But they did achieve the mission. They killed the military commander of the armed wing of Hamas. They killed Barakha. Now, in killing him, it may open the door for more if not peace-loving, certainly more accommodating voices in Gaza to spring up and begin speaking with the Israelis. This is not to suggest that there was any cooperation by Hamas in the Israeli killing of Baraka, but there may have been some intelligence cooperation with Egypt, with some of the intelligence going to Egypt from Hamas. Baraka has been a continual impediment in any kind of ceasefire to stop these incendiary balloons and the Katusha attacks on Israeli cities. There were Israeli casualties. They were medevaced to the hospital in Beersheba, to the military wing of the hospital in Beersheba by helicopter. Um, following, the me following the medevacking, the Israelis disclosed the death of the two officers, including the commander. They were extracted after airstrikes were ordered at the position of those who attacked their small motorcade. Nonetheless, it was a costly mission, but a successful one. Meanwhile, we move on this week in prophecy. We are told in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 13, that it is the Lord God who establishes kings and removes kings. And he gives his people wisdom and understanding to comprehend these things. This, of course, sets the stage in Daniel 2 for what would ultimately climax in chapter 11. The Maccabees and those who were in the last days would come in the character of the Maccabees in Daniel 11, 33 to 35. Those who understand and have insight and would give understanding to the many the way the Maccabees did, so will be the case with the people who are able to understand the nature and identity of the Antichrist as the Maccabees did with the Shikusa Meshomem of their day, Antiochus, Epiphanes, and his image. But we read this in Daniel chapter 2, the Lord will give wisdom and understanding to those to understand what is really transpiring politically and strategically and economically. The world does not really know. The cleverest people in the world do not really know. But the faithful 
sons and daughters of the Lord are called to know, the Lord will give them wisdom. This being the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, popularly known as the Armistice, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, when the war known as the Great War ended. Now, this Great War was devastating in Great Britain. More people were killed from the military in World War I than in World War II in Britain. It was the Blitz, it was the civilian casualties that made World War II worse than the First World War. But when you see the cenotaphs and the memorials in all the villages and towns in England, more were always killed, whole families of soldiers wiped out, brothers, cousins, fathers and sons even, killed in the trench warfare of the First World War. And so it went. Major military conflicts in continental Europe, such as the Somme, major conflicts in the Dardanelles in Turkey with uh, Gallipoli, and so forth. Well, let's understand what happened and why this was so important and significant historically now that we have the 100th year anniversary of the end of this devastating war. That was supposed to be the war to end all wars, but it wasn't. We had a very corrupt Wilson administration who ran on a, who ran on a peace platform but then took the nation into war. There were all kinds of excuses given. The Zimmerman note uh, alleging that the German foreign ministry was trying to persuade Mexico to attack the United States. The sinking of the Lusitania, which Americans were killed, attributed to German submarine warfare, which it may have been. Nonetheless, he ran on a peace platform, but took the country into war. This is very similar to what Lyndon Johnson did when he ran against Barry Goldwater. He presented Barry Goldwater as a war hawk, while he and Robert McNamara and Dean Rust were preparing to expand Vietnam themselves with Maxwell Taylor. This kind of open hypocrisy and lying has always characterized the Democratic Party in the United States, and I say that not as a Republican. I'm not a Republican. The Republican Party has been no less corrupt. The world is in the power of the wicked one. I'm simply stating historical realities and how they relate to history. When the Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated by Giovanni Princip in Sarajevo, Bosnia, the Balkans, being a powder keg, exploded into a war. But due to entangling alliances, France and Russia were drawn in, and then with the French entry, Britain was drawn in through an alliance with France. American bankers such as J.P. Morgan and others lent fantastic sums of money to the European powers who were fighting the Kaiser, and there was an economic interest in recovering the principal. Uh, that was certainly a factor in why America entered to make the world, quote unquote, safe for democracy. It did not make the world safe and it did not engender democracy. Rather, it was the first major step towards globalism. They attempted it with the League of Nations. American nationalism, and some would have called it isolationism, prevented the United States from entering the League of Nations at the Versailles Conference that Mr. Wilson wanted America to join. It didn't happen. It happened instead with the United Nations after the Second World War, but the first attempt at globalization was then. It was the first attempt. You had major international trade, but major international banking. Again, it was nothing like exists today with electronic trading and so forth, but it was the harbinger of what was later to come in international commerce. There were economic pressures on the American government to enter the war. There were other reasons that the United States entered the war. Initially, American industry profited on the war, supplying Great Britain. There was a huge terrorist attack, the biggest terrorist attack that ever happened in the United States up until that time at a place called the Black Tom in New Jersey, on the New Jersey waterfront, near what is today the Statue of Liberty, before the Statue of Liberty was presented by France to the United States, it was um, Bedloe's Island. And adjacent to it, on the New Jersey side of New York Harbor, was a peninsula called Black Tom that was noted for its railroad yards, warehouses, 
and for unloading wares from trains onto ships. This was a major, major port of transport of armaments to Great Britain from the United States, who was supplying Britain, beneficial to American industry. This took place orchestrated by someone called Hans von Papen, Hans von Papen, a German, that later would emerge in the Reich of Hitler. Hans von Papen would later head the Centrum, the Roman Catholic political party of Bavaria that made the coalition that brought Adolf Hitler to power. At Nuremberg, and in the aftermath of the Second World War, the British and the Americans wanted to hang Hans von Papen as a Nazi collaborator. This same Hans von Papen, who was responsible for the terrorist attack in New York during the First World War prior to the American entry. But Pope Pius XII intervened politically and saved von Papen's life. His sentence was commuted to eight years. Hence, we have a direct link between the Vatican, this is not conspiracy theory, the First World War and the Second World War. We have to remember that the Vatican supported and made the, verse, made the uh, Lateran Treaty with Mussolini. That Mussolini did the bidding of the Roman Catholic Church, outlawing all evangelicals and Protestants and restricting the Valdesi, what's left of the Waldensians. When Mussolini invaded Ethiopia, he expelled all evangelical missionaries at the behest of the Vatican. This is what was taking place with Pope Pius XI and Pope Pius XII, this open, open corruption. But make no mistake, as the Roman Catholic author John Cornwall, among others, aptly wrote in his book, Hitler's Pope, the Vatican was instrumental in the rise of international fascism. From Perón in Argentina, to Franco in Spain, to Mussolini in Italy, and to Adolf Hitler in Germany. The Centrum, headed by Franz von Papen, of World War I terrorist attack in New York Harbor fame, made with the Nazis, bringing the Nazis to power. Hitler never would have been elected had it not been for the coalition with the Centrum, when the Hindenburg government began to disintegrate. Be that as it may, let's understand the relationship now between the First and Second World War that was commemorated this week in prophecy with the armistice. The ramification of World War I for Germany was the Versailles Treaty, imposed with the backing of the United States, but primarily by Britain and France against Germany. This is what created the nationalist support for Hitler that otherwise would not have existed. I recall in my youth watching the Nazi hunter, Hein Weisenthal, when I was about 12 years old in New York. He was on late night TV in New York being interviewed. He spoke quite good English. And he was asked, were all Germans Nazis? And he actually laughed. He actually laughed. He said, Fewer than 15% of Germans were ideological Nazis. Hitler would not have gained that kind of momentum had it not been for the Depression, but also for the compounding effect of the Versailles Treaty. This is what allowed Hitler to come. Had there not been a World War I, there would not be a World War II. People in Iowa and in California did not know anything about Giovello Princip or the Archduke of Ferdinand. What was the assassination to them in Sarajevo, Bosnia, a place most of them had hardly heard of? England the same. People in Cornwall or Leicestershire or people in Scotland in Strathclyde or people in uh, Lancashire or Yorkshire, they, they didn't know anything about the Balkans. But these entangling alliances drew Britain in following Russia and France. Everything changed. Everything. Including the following. The end of the Hohenzollern Empire. That is the dynasty that ruled Germany. The end of the German Empire. 
Hitler tried to revive it with his Anschluss, his annexation of, of Austria and with his invasion of the Sudeten and so forth, but it was the end of the German Empire and the collapse of the Hohenzollern dynasty. Second, it was the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the end of the Austrian Empire, that is the end of the Habsburg dynasty, who'd been around for centuries, being the primary Roman Catholic dynasty in much of Europe, particularly Southeast Europe. But even beyond, at various times, the Habsburgs extended their dynasty into as far west as Spain. So it was the end of the German Empire, end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Thirdly, it was the end of the Russian Empire under the Tsars. During World War I in 1917, you had what took place in St. Petersburg, in Leningrad, when the Bolsheviks came to power. Fourth, you had the end of the Ottoman Empire, the end of the Turkish Empire, which was massive, extending throughout most of the Middle East from modern Turkey and, and from north of Istanbul all the way down to the tip of the Arabian Peninsula and almost, almost to Iran. At various times, the Ottoman Empire controlled even certain areas of Egypt and Europe. It was very big geographically. The Turks, being Muslims themselves, subjugated the Arabs and treated them as almost subhuman. This was the background of Lawrence Arabia and how he was able to muster Arab nationalism. Remember, Arab nationalism was not the invention originally in its modern form of radical Muslims. It was the invention of the British who tried to galvanize the Arabs to fight the Turks, much the same as the American CIA and the British tried to galvanize Islamic unity against the Soviet Union following the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. But any time the West has armed, supported, any kind of Islamic unity, it has always turned against the West. It doesn't matter if it was the Taliban. Remember, bin Laden was part of a cadre of people, Arabs fighting the Russians and the Soviets in Afghanistan, armed by the American CIA and financed by Saudi Arabia in collaboration with the CIA. That's how he began. Well, it was the same thing with the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans aligned themselves with Germany. They saw in World War I what was happening in the Middle East as a sideshow with General Allenby. They saw it as a sideshow, not understanding what it really meant in terms of biblical prophecy. We'll return to that point in a moment. So we have the end of the Russian Empire, the end of the Hohenzollern dynasty and of the German Empire, the end of the Habsburgs, although they still exist, they're not a dynasty, they're just a financially affluent family, similar to the Rockefellers, a European version of it, similar to the Rothschilds, etc., or the, the Fords, the DuPonts, whatever. Then you have the end of Russia under the Tsars, and the Bolsheviks come to power. But it was also the beginning of the end of the British Empire, the first signs of the British Empire cracking, because of the huge casualty statistics that came out of trench warfare, and because of the military disaster to the Anglo-Australian and ANZUS forces in Gallipoli. Now, another factor that came into play was this. When Adolf Hitler first revealed his hand in Munich, there were people in England, such as Winston Churchill, who wanted to stop him then. Much the same as the American general and, and, and fighter pilot, Billy Mitchell, warned that the Japanese would attack Pearl Harbor 20 years before it happened, 
nearly 18 years before it happened, and he was court-martialed for telling the truth and being right. So, too, it was all political. So, too, Mr. Churchill warned what Hitler was going to do. But he was not listened to. He was discredited. He was half American. His mother was American, but he was paternally a descendant of the Duke of Barbara from an aristocratic, traditional, blue-blooded English family. Mr. Churchill had been the second lord of the admiralty, and it was largely, largely his strategic concoction to try to capture the Dardanelles that resulted in the military disaster with humongous casualties in Gallipoli. He had this hanging over him. He did not pack the punch or credibility he might otherwise have done had it not been for World War I. Thus, we have to understand once more the relationship between World War I and World War II, the Second World War. Another sign of the beginning of the cracking up of the British Empire, again, it was only showing incipient cracks, but a precedent was set. Using Zeppelins, of all things, for the first time, mainland England and London were bombed by the Germans using Zeppelins. Again, nothing like the Blitz of the Second World War, but the precedent was set. And finally, the breakup of empire. The precedent was set with the Irish uprising that ultimately culminated with the, um, not only the black and tans trying to suppress Irish nationalism, but the Easter uprising. These things all came about as a result of the First World War. The beginning of the end of the British Empire, the end of the German Empire and Hohenzollern dynasty, the end of the Romanov dynasty and the Russian Empire, the end of the Habsburg dynasty and the Austrian-Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the end of the Ottoman Empire that had been around for centuries in the 16th century, threatening Europe itself being turned back by the Polish under King Jan Sobieski on the outskirts of Vienna, but still a viable force that occupied even Southeast Europe into the Balkans, uh, areas of Romania and so forth. They were under the control of the Ottoman Empire at various points. After the war, the map of Europe and the Middle East had to be redrawn. You had the birth of globalism with the League of Nations. The United States kept itself out of it. Britain and France dominated it, at least initially. But something else happened. Again, everyone's focus was on the war in continental Europe. What was happening with Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence, that was happening with General Allenby, and was happening with the ANZUS forces in the Middle East, were again seen as a sideshow, but not in God's economy. That destruction of the power of the Ottoman Empire gave birth to two things. The rise of Arab nationalism, not necessarily strongly Islamic in its flavor. Let's remember, Saddam Hussein, Gamal Abdul Nasser, even Assad of Syria, they are Arab nationalists, but they are not radical Islamists. In fact, they themselves have opposed radical Islamists when radical Islamists were a threat to their position. It's quite complicated. People in the West will tend to automatically identify Arab nationalism with radical Islam. It's not that simple. There are elements of Arab nationalism or Iranian Aryan nationalism, certainly, that are identified with fundamentalist Islam, but there are elements that absolutely are not. Um, the Hashemite government of Jordan is another example. So after World War I, the map of Europe had to be with, redrawn. Borders were changed. 
places were given to Poland that used to be German speaking, like the city of Danzig. Many things happened like that. Alsace-Lorraine in France was largely Germanic, but it was given back to France. And again, it became a point of contention for Hitler's invasion of France. But in the Middle East, everything was with, redrawn. These countries like Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, were created in the aftermath of the First World War by the European colonial powers. You had, and what was agreed at the time to be, a Palestinian Arab state with a Hashemite Bedouin government from the tribe of Mohammed who were of, of Arabian, Saudi Arabian origin that exists today with King Abdullah II, his great-grandfather, King Abdullah I, having been assassinated in the Al-Aqsa Mosque for trying to make peace with the Israelis. His father having been King Hussein and his father's grandfather having been King Abdullah I. This goes back to the aftermath of the First World War. You see, Iraq is three countries. Southern Iraq is Shia Arabs who are religiously more akin and more in harmony with the beliefs of the Iranians. You have the area around Baghdad, which is Sunni Muslim, and you have northern Iraq, which is Kurdish. Three diverse religious and ethnic regions fused into one. It's an artificially created state. Who created Iraq? Well, the British and French. Who created Syria? Well, the French. Lebanon was taken, and it was supposed to be largely Christian. It was supposed to be the Christian area of the Middle East for Arab Christians. It was to be mainly an Arab Christian state. Now, by Christian, I don't mean necessarily born again or evangelical. It was largely Roman Catholic. The phalangists, who embraced their own form of fascism under the Jamaliel family, uh, again, they claimed they were French-speaking, although they spoke Arabic, their, their mother tongue was French. They considered themselves to be Europeans who lived in the Middle East. And they would say, Je suis un Phoenician. Um, you know, I'm a Phoenician. They saw themselves as descendants of King Hiram and things like this. They did not wish to be identified, per se, as ordinary Arabs. They saw themselves as Franco-Arabs, as people who are culturally and politically European. That was to be Lebanon. Later, of course, there'd be power grabs by Hezbollah in Lebanon, backed by Syria and Iran, to gain control, but it was a state that was created by the French, as was Syria. But also, the rebirth of Israel. Israel became a British mandate. The British came and they built a road system, a port in Haifa, a railway. They built a lot of infrastructure. And because of the Belfour Declaration, a Jewish scientist developed a method for the synthetic production of gunpowder, Chaim Weizmann. This endeared Jewish intellectual prowess to the British government. And it was a factor in determining the Belfour Declaration by Lord Belfour, saying that the Jews had a right to return to their land. Ultimately, they would only get about 21% of what they were initially promised, which they accepted, anything to get a state in the aftermath of the Holocaust. But Zionism really took off during this period as a direct result of what transpired in World War I. Most people and most Christians do not realize not only the historical importance, but the prophetic importance. It was a very confused mess. The fall of the Austrian Empire, the fall of the German Empire, the fall of the Russian Empire, the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the beginning of the breakdown of the British Empire with the Irish uprising. It was all confused. 
these dynasties that had ruled Europe, the Romanovs, the Hohenzollerns, the Habsburgs, everything was radically changed very, very quickly. How do you make sense of this chaos? To this day, secular historians argue about it. Many would agree. Probably most would agree. It was stupid for major European powers like Russia and France to have become engaged in what was initially a local war in the Balkans. More stupid was the British getting involved in a continental war in Europe. From the sinking of the Armada to the defeat of Napoleon, Britain always wanted to keep itself separate from Europe. But then, stupidity upon stupidity was the American entry into the First World War. And far from being the war to end all wars, as was promised by the politicians of the day, it basically planted the seeds for the rise of fascism, including Nazism, and the Second World War. We are told Yahweh, the Lord, establishes kings and removes kings. Why did he allow a Hitler and a Stalin? Remember, Stalin killed at least two and a half times as many people as Hitler. Stalin was also an anti-Semite. After the time of Lenin, when Stalin got power, he killed Trotsky, he killed Zinoviev, he expelled Jews from the party. Ultimately, the Soviet Union became very anti-Zionist, ultimately, trying to destroy Israel by surrogate means arming the surrounding Arab countries, particularly Egypt and Syria, under Nasser and the Assad regime. Why did God allow Hitler and Stalin, these terrible people? Israel was a nation that rejected its Messiah and is under the judgment of God, yet they needed to return to Israel to facilitate the return of Christ. Jesus made this clear in Matthew 23. You will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. The Jews must be there. They must be there to fulfill the prophecies of Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. In Jerusalem, the Jews will look upon me, speaking in the first person in the Old Testament now, by the Holy Spirit through Zechariah. They'll look upon me who they have pierced crucified, and mourn as one mourns for an only son, Luke 21, 24, a prophecy that's in the process of being fulfilled as we speak, although it is not yet completely fulfilled, Jerusalem will be trampled by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. Okay. For these prophecies to take place, there had to be Zionism. There had to be the rebirth of the Jewish nation. Let's remember, generations before this, American preachers like Harry Ironside were saying the Jews would go back. Well before that, in the 17th century, there were English Puritan evangelical preachers saying the same thing. John and Charles Wesley in the 18th century believed Israel would be restored and reborn as a nation. Christians believed in this before most Jews did. In fact, when Theodore Herzl came and established the Zionist movement and his followers like Ben Gordian and Nahum Goldman, Zionism was almost uniformly condemned by all rabbis. Reformed Rabbis in the United States called their synagogues temples, meaning they forsook the temple ever being rebuilt in Jerusalem. The promised land was now New York and Miami. That was their belief. And today it still functionally is the belief of many American Jews who are becoming increasingly alienated from Israel because of the left-wing political leaning of so many in American Jewry. What I call the Menelaus 
complex. Menelaus being the Jewish collaborator with Antiochus Epiphanes in the book of Daniel. You see when Mr. Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem, where was Debbie Washerman Schultz? Where was Senator Blumenthal or Senator Chuck Schumer? They weren't there. They weren't there. The only one who was there was a former senator, Joseph Leibowitz, and he's a traditional Democrat. He was not like what the Democrats are today. He goes back to the Democratic Party of people like JFK. Very different now, this alienation taking place. But where does this come about? Had it not been for the Holocaust and the pogroms of Stalin, Israel would not have been reborn as a nation. There would not have been the international support and sympathy to reestablish the Jewish state had it not been for Auschwitz, Buchenwald. Terrible things. Horrible things. Why did God allow it? To bring about the reestablishment of Israel. Once Stalin got control of Russia, Jewish socialists who initially supported Bolshevism and, 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 and Mosheviks in order to stop the pogroms being perpetrated by the czars, often at the behest of the Russian Orthodox Church, realized what had happened in Russia. And they tried to transplant a Jewish version of communism, of socialism, that would be truly democratic and egalitarian. They began the kibbutz movement and the moshavs in Israel. Although they become socioeconomically largely obsolete, they were the only form of socialism, and, and certainly the only form of communism, of communism, that was generally democratic and egalitarian. Just that it economically did not work. Socialism long term never does. Nonetheless, that's how it happened. Yes, the Lord establishes and removes. Even Hitler and Stalin, even demon-possessed men, he's in control. Now, we understand something further. We are told in that passage in Daniel that it is the Lord who establishes the times and the laws. The public ministry of Jesus was three and a half years. A time will come when Satan will demand and receive equal time within certain parameters for a fixed time frame, these will be given into his hand for two times a time and a half time, three and a half lunar years, thereabout, under the Antichrist. He will demand equal time with the public ministry of Jesus. But up until that time, the lordship of history belongs to the God of Israel. He not exactly forfeits it, but suspends it for three and a half years at a forthcoming time. That may happen in our lifetime. But we have to go back to understand the armistice in World War I to see how this came about. World War I was not a war that ended all wars. In fact, once again, it planted the seeds for World War II. But God had a hand in it. And so it continues. It continues to this very day. Unless we understand history, we can never understand prophecy. The world and its academics, its political scholars, its politicians certainly, are confused and debate. Why World War I? Why did America and Britain get into this? Why did France and Russia get into it? How could a local dispute in the Falklands have resulted in what it did? And then if it was the war to end all wars, why did it provide the fertile soil for the planting of the seeds of Nazism? Quite a thing. Quite a thing indeed. But the Lord, we're told in Daniel, gives wisdom to his people. He gives them knowledge. We are to understand what these things mean and how they point to the return of Jesus. 
how they affect God's purpose for Israel and the Jews and for the true church. It's happening. In Britain yesterday, they had the memorial service at the Cenotaph in London in Whitehall, and people wore poppies. In England, you have days where people will go to church for cultural reasons, one of which is Armistice Day or Poppy Day. They'll put on a poppy and go to church culturally. They'll do the same thing on Mothering Sunday. It's like the English British Mother's Day. It's purely cultural. It's not faith. Much the same as in the United States and other countries, you will have people who, for cultural reasons, will go to church once or twice a year at Christmas or Easter or uh, for some rite of passage, a sprinkling of an infant or a funeral or a wedding or something of this nature, but that's it. And of course, the churches in Britain that are gospel-believing will take advantage of that opportunity and use it for evangelistic purposes. And God bless them. I was at such a church speaking at one yesterday in Yorkshire in the north of England. These are the realities. When we see these events transpiring in the political realm, in the strategic realm, in the economic realm, we are to know that the Lord, through Scripture, by the illumination of His Spirit, wants us to have knowledge and understanding, not only of what is happening, but what it means prophetically, and what the outcome will be. We are actually to know how these things ultimately climax and end, penultimately with the Antichrist, but ultimately with the victorious return of Christ. Some people just went to church, or they watched a politician put a wreath on the tomb of the unknown soldier in Arlington Cemetery near Washington, or they watched the queen place the wreath on the cenotaph, or the memorial service for the ANZUS troops that were killed in Gallipoli and in Sydney and Canberra in Australia. It's cultural. It's historical. But they don't know why. The world does not know why. The unsaved do not know why. Backslidden Israel rejecting its own Messiah largely does not know why. They don't know why. But the people who believe in the Lord Jesus and trust him for their salvation, the regenerate believers, those who are truly born again and believe the scripture, we are to know why. Now, of course, Satan has raised up deceivers like Rick Warren who say, avoid end time prophecy, it's a diversion. Ignore what Jesus said. Be alert. Watch for these signs. Forget the Olivet Discourse. Ignore Jesus. This is the teaching of Rick Warren. He actually said this. He's sent by Satan to mislead the church away from what Jesus said we should be watching for. But the faithful church will understand these things from a prophetic perspective. They will know why World War I happened and why God allowed such a terrible thing for his greater purposes. They will know why the Second World War and the Blitz and the Holocaust happened. They will know. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. You had the revocation of the Belfour Declaration. After promising the Jews the right to return, Jews were denied that right to return to their ancestral homeland. And many perished in the Holocaust as a result and burned as a consequence of Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Coventry, Liverpool, and London burned. It's terrible. Now, my grandparents, my family were from Britain. I live in Britain part of the time. I take no delight in this. But it happened. And if the British government keeps going the way it's going with Theresa May, and worse, if Mr. Corbyn, an enemy of Israel is elected. The judgment of God will come on Britain brutally. Just think of Theresa May when she, again, we've mentioned this in the past in this week in prophecy, when at the behest of Barack Obama before he left office, voted in the UN 
in the UNESCO vote, saying that the Jews have no historical or religious right to claim the Welling Wall, the Kotel, or the religious sites of Jerusalem. This was her vote. Then she called the general election in Britain and nearly lost it. She was wiped out politically. It was only the largely evangelical Northern Irish Unionist parties that saved her neck. This is God's judgment. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And so it shall happen. We are to understand these things. We're not to be in the dark. We're not to be like the apostate church. We are not to be like the pseudo-evangelical church of Rick Warren. We are not to be like the world. We are to be a people of knowledge and understanding. Having the word of God illuminated by the Holy Spirit to understand these current events prophetically. This is what the Lord wants for his children. But let's move on this week in prophecy. As part of the celebrations this week in prophecy, Mr. Trump flew to France. But he did this after Emmanuel Macron, a man who panders to radical Islam in his country, despite the theater attacks, despite the Charlie Hebron murders, despite all of these things, he continues to genuflect towards radical Islam. That's his policy. Now, you have to understand many people in Britain and a great many people in America are disappointed in France. France was America's first military ally. America would not have had its independence without Lafayette. Most unlikely. Nonetheless, something went wrong. In the Second World War, you had the Vichy French, the French who joined with the Nazis. And it was a significant amount of them in North Africa and in France itself. But then you had something else. At Dunkirk, France had had the largest army in Western Europe, bigger than Hitler's numerically. The French had approximately 66 divisions, 66 divisions that refused to fight, that ran away like cowards abandoning the bravery and the military history that they had under people like Napoleon, for better or worse, or some of the incredible bravery displayed by France in the First World War. That was abandoned. They ran like cowards. Then they waited for the Americans and British to liberate them from the Nazis. And then, under the Marshall Plan, they waited for the Americans to rebuild France. And then, in the wake of the Soviet threat, in the aftermath of the war, the French withdrew their troops from NATO and hid on back of America and Britain, who were in Germany, separating France from the Warsaw Pact. Now, again, this history of cowardice that has defined France for the last 60, 70, 80 years was not always like that. The French showed tremendous bravery at other times in history and tremendous pro-Americanism. I was born in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty. It was a gift from France an icon of American freedom. It came from the French as a gift. I am not anti-French. Although my daughter speaks perfect Parisian French, she did her law degree partly in France, the Col de Deux, and a joint program. My French was Quebec French, and my daughter, of course, makes fun of it. But I'm certainly something of a Francophile. I've always admired French history, French art. French literature. I'm not anti-French. 
But something has happened to France in the last three generations that continues to get worse. Just before Mr. Trump came to France, of all things, Emmanuel Macron stated that Europe needs a united military to protect itself, not just from Russia and China, but from the United States. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, has reiterated his belief that Europe needs its own army, citing one perceived threat as the main reason. On ne protégera pas les Européens si on ne décide pas d'avoir une vraie armée européenne. Mm -hmm. Face à la Russie qui est à nos frontières et qui a montré qu'elle pouvait être menaçante, moi je veux construire un vrai dialogue de sécurité avec la Russie, qui est un pays que je respecte, qui est européen. Une armée Mais européenne. on doit avoir une Europe qui se défend davantage seule et sans dépendre seulement des États-Unis et de manière plus souveraine. There are cemeteries with thousands of dead Americans buried who died on the beach, Normandy Beach, Utah Beach. They died in the Normandy invasions, liberating France. Omaha Beach, incredible casualties. Thousands of Americans buried on French soil. France, America's first ally, Marquis de Lafayette, friend and confidant of George Washington. Now, Mr. Macron says they need a military to protect themselves from America. This reinforces the interpretation of Daniel, of the iron and the clay that they tried to make stick together, America not being a part of it. When Mr. Trump arrives, Mr. Macron gives a speech where he denounces nationalism and Mr. Trump's version of it. But for all the expressions of unity, the host, French President Emmanuel Macron, delivered a pointed message about the lessons of World War I, an admonition that appeared aimed at President Trump, who calls himself a nationalist. Le nationalisme. Nationalism is a betrayal of patriotism by saying, aren't you first who cares about the others? Saying that it's unpatriotic for Europeans to do it because he's afraid that with people like Nigel Farage and with Brexit in Great Britain and growing nationalist movements in Sweden of people who are fed up with radical Islamic intimidation and the EU and in Holland with Gerd Wilders and now even in Italy, he's afraid of a Mr. Trump coming to power in one of the major European economies. Angela Merkel recently lost the local by-elections in Hesse province because she wants to bring a million Arab Muslims into Germany. There is a nationalist reaction to it. Mr. Macron is a globalist, and so he denounces Mr. Trump at a time when America, France, and Britain should be remembering the tens of thousands of French, American, and British who died in the defense and the liberation of France. This is quite a thing. It's an insult, but most people do not understand what is happening prophetically. His continual pandering to radical Islam, there is a reaction against him with Mr. Le Pen. I've been warning for years, and also Ms. Le Pen. I've been warning for years, and I mean for like nearly 20 years, certainly for 15, that if the mainstream political parties of Western Europe do not stand up against Islamic immigration and radical Islam, there is going to be a move to the extreme right where you're going to have people who are not against radical Islam. They're going to be racists who hate people for being Arabs or for being black Africans or for being Jews. These things always in European history invariably turn to be some kind of anti-Semitism. It is Eastern Europe, Poland, Hungary, 
these countries who are standing firm against the radical Islamic threat and who are flexing their muscle against the powers of Western Europe. But he who pays the piper calls the tune. They make the iron stick to the clay. As we've said many times, the European Central Bank is just the German Bundesbank with a new name. The euro is simply the old Deutschmark with a new name. Again, I refer you to our other teachings from the book of Daniel. But these things came into play and focus this very week. This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy also saw the aftermath of the American midterm congressional elections much contested. It's interesting that Mr. Trump was largely responsible for the victory of increasing the number of Republicans within his party in the Senate. Some political analysts blame Paul Ryan and the establishment Republicans for their poor leadership and the poor performance of Republicans in the House for not retaining that power. But there's no question that it was Mr. Trump's Make America Great Again type rallies that energized enough of the party base to make the gains in the Senate. Now understand what's happening in America. Remember, Jesus said once again, you'll be brought before magistrates and kings. There will be a transfer of power to the judiciary. We've seen this in Europe, and we've seen it with the European Court of Justice, with the international courts in The Hague, but we're seeing it certainly in the United States. There's no way to get same-sex marriage legislatively, so the Supreme Court will impose it. Get left-wing judges, agenda is judges. These have to be approved by the Senate. Mr. Kavanaugh, Mr. Gorsuch, Mr. Trump has brilliantly turned the tide. Understand what's happening. With Barack Obama, he did not retain control of either house. Normally, the party that wins the general election and has the White House suffers major losses in the midterm elections. Under Mr. Trump, his party made gains in the Senate, and the losses in the House were limited compared to previous elections. They were nothing like the losses experienced by Barack Obama, who considered it and called it publicly a shellacking in this first midterm election. Some election nights are more fun than others. Some are exhilarating. Uh, some are humbling. And yesterday's vote confirmed what I've heard from folks all across America. People are frustrated. Over the last two years, we've made progress. But clearly, too many Americans haven't felt that progress yet. And they told us that yesterday. And as president, I take responsibility for that. Now, I'm not recommending for every future president that they take a shellacking like, they, like I did last night. Um, you know, I'm sure there are easier ways to learn these lessons. Under the Democrats, they lost three midterm elections in a row. It was not even as injurious to the Republican Party as what happened to the Democrats under Bill Clinton, although the Obama losses were almost phenomenal. Barack Obama was the weakest, most inept political leader of the Democratic Party in modern history. He lost over a thousand seats nationally, nearly a thousand seats alone in state legislatures and senates, control of both houses, etc. Now understand what's happening. When that took place, Barack Obama tried to make himself a kind of a little dictator who could rule by fiat. His exact words, I have a pen and a cell phone. Uh, we are not just going to be waiting for legislation in order to make sure uh, that we're providing Americans uh, the kind of help that they need. Uh, I've got a pen and I've got a phone. 
uh, and I can use that pen to sign executive orders uh, and take executive action. Executive orders, executive orders, executive orders. Those are challenged in court by the states and by other litigants. Hence, a transfer of power to the judiciary. Now you even have left-wing judges who are trying to say that Mr. Trump does not have the power legally to negate or recall or cancel executive orders of his predecessor. Remember, these are not laws passed by Congress. They're simply directives by the White House being treated as law by left-wing judges. There's a battle in the judiciary. There was more to the Kavanaugh case than meets the eye. If Justice Ginsburg goes on to meet the God of her fathers or is forced for medical reasons to retire, she broke three ribs last week, we know what Mr. Trump is going to do. He's going to appoint a conservative woman, almost certainly, a pro-life woman. In other words, the real power in America is in the executive branch and in the judiciary and in the Senate. It's the Senate who confirms these judges. It is only the Senate who can impeach these judges and remove them. The House has no real role in it. Ruling by fiat, by executive order, instead of by legislation, and politicians love that. We'll let the White House decide, we'll let the courts decide, so we don't have to. Because if we're pro-same-sex marriage, we'll lose votes. And if we're against it, we'll lose votes. So this way we don't lose any votes because we don't have to do anything. That's the House, both parties. Both parties. But these judges will wield more and more power and they are appointed by the president, but need the approval of the Senate, not the House. They can create political fanfare, impeach Mr. Trump, even though there's no real grounds for impeachment, as even serious Democrat legates who are honest, such as Alan Dershowitz, admit. They can do it to create a political storm. When they lost the last election, they began saying Russian collusion and demanded a special prosecutor. And they got one, except the special prosecutor hasn't indicted anybody for collusion with Russia. He's indicted other people for crimes committed years ago unrelated to Mr. Trump. A complete farce, a political witch hunt. They can do things like that because it's all they can do. These losses were unfortunate, and I do blame Paul Ryan and the Republican Party establishment in the House. I blame them for it. Nonetheless, it was not nearly as bad as the shellacking that the Democrats took in three midterms in a row, and sorry, three congressional elections in a row, or what Barack Obama particularly described as his shellacking. It was limited because of Mr. Trump, who made gains in the Senate, which is what really counts in the appointment of these judges and of certain other things in the upper house. Nancy Pelosi will do her bit, but the real power is in the Senate, the courts, and the White House. This has to be understood. As I've been saying, I am not speaking politically or campaigning for any party or endorsing any politician. What I am saying is these political conflicts reflect spiritual conflict in the heavenlies. And in this, there's a battle for American support of Israel. There is a battle for opposition to radical Islam and radical Islamic immigration. There is a battle over abortion. There's only pro-life and pro-death but now the pro-death is called reproductive rights. There's a battle, same-sex marriage. There's a battle over these issues. 
But once again, it is by the Lord who establishes kings and removes them. And the faithful believers will be given understanding and wisdom by the Holy Spirit to make sense out of the chaos, to know what is happening, why it's happening, and why it's going to happen. As I have before, I'd point people back to the book of Zechariah. There were all manner of events happening politically and so forth in the book of Nehemiah, Ezra, and Haggai, and the opposition from the Samaritans and so forth, and Tobias and Sanballat. That's a historical record of what was taking place on the earth, but Zechariah, their contemporary, pulls the curtain back and shows us what was happening in the heavenlies with Yeshua, not Jesus, but the other Yeshua, the high priest, and the descendant of the king, Zerubbabel, standing before the throne of God and Satan there accusing them. These things that were happening in Israel were a reflection of what was happening in the heavenlies. Daniel shows us this. The principalities over Persia, Iran. The book of Revelation shows us this. But don't expect the world to know it. Please pray for the Christians who are in government, particularly Mike Pence. Please pray that Mr. Trump listens to informed believers, not the lunatic believers. Please continue to pray. Something is happening. It's happening in the United States, it's happening in Europe, and it's happening in the Middle East. Now, you can say something is always happening in those places, and that is true. But we are reaching a stage where things unique are happening. It's just that the world does not realize it. Yesterday was Armstead's Day. Okay. People commemorated it, but they didn't understand it. Very few. Very few. Even many Christians didn't understand what really happened in First World War and how it relates to the prophecies of Daniel or the Second World War and how that relates to the prophecies of Daniel. They didn't understand it. But we ought to understand. The Lord will give us wisdom and knowledge. He will tell us and guide us in everything we need in order to prepare the way for the return of his son. I'm not an alarmist. I'm not saying Jesus will be here Tuesday. But I am saying these things are all of tremendous and growing prophetic importance. They have not happened before. Israel is only regathered as a nation twice, according to Isaiah 11. The first time happened after the Babylonian captivity. This is the second. It is unique. It is different than the other times in history. Believers thought it was the last days. Yes, there's been apostasy before. Yes, there's other people who tried to unite the Roman Empire once again from Charlemagne to Napoleon. That is all true. But not at the same time. The Jews are back in their land and beginning to return to a saving faith in their Messiah in increasing numbers. Not yet huge numbers, but huge compared to how many there were 25, 30 years ago. Indeed, Daniel chapter 2 and many corresponding passages all coming in the focus, all coming in to an epiphany of realization to those who really seek the Lord this week in prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless. Thank you for listening. Please continue to pray for the British government that Mr. Corbyn does not come to power. And again, I'm not campaigning politically, but he's an enemy of Israel and no friend of Christians. He will bring God's judgment on Britain if he comes to power. Please continue to pray for President Trump and for Vice President Mike Pence. Please continue to pray for the new Prime Minister of Australia. 
these men need our prayers. If they are not being influenced by our prayers, they're going to be influenced by something else. And of course, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for Benjamin Netanyahu. Literally, in Hebrew, it's inquire into the welfare. Shalu shalom Yerushalayim. Remember, he who keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Neither slumbers nor sleeps. Hine lo yanum velo yishan shomer Israel. Once again, this is James Jacob Prash from Oriel Ministries. This week in prophecy. God bless.